in a straight line from here, absolutely straight line, and a late turn sliding across this apex. And here we have the girls. What do you think? <laughs> You're making it groan anyway, you girls. Oh, are we on the hill now? That's it, yeah. Come on. No, come on, you girls, it won't do you no harm. When, when you stop, I'll tow you. Come on. Stopping. Together. Sorry. It's all right. Break. We might have to. All the way? Yeah, no, not all the way. will be making you steer. Is your window? Why is your window down?
legs out closer. Which legs are we on now? We're going to pedal. Now you keep control. There's only one pedaling. Sarah's the fittest. I wonder if they're gonna I wonder if they'll get the girls. Let's get out of the way and then we can No, the stock, we're just going to yeah. it, the stock because of the girls. Oh. Well, that's what we're here for, so I suppose... Uh... I mean, you really ought to... <laughs> I think yes, uh, rather than a, a Grand Prix uh, Formula 1 star, my mission has always been to build an exciting, very fast saloon GT type vehicle. Now with an engine size, that Yes, it, it's always been the case uh, a small 2 litre Formula 2 type vehicle, uh, Formula 1 vehicle of course, it's got better handling but not the power. But uh, it may, to the layman, may appear that uh, a seven-liter engine is a huge advantage. Along with that, you get a, a weight problem and balance. Uh, this creates terrible handling problems, particularly in power over steer braking. Are you optimistic about that? Um, I wouldn't have thought so. I, I'm playing it very cool. We're we're going to enter. We're going to go for a, a finish because. Uh, my co-driver Kevin Riley is scheduled to drive at Silverstone Monday and we're hoping that we're going to complete the two races. It's an exciting project that everyone's shown a lot of interest in, people want to see it and I always feel that it's nice to appear on the day when it's advertised. What about the charity aspect of the car because I know you're giving all your prize money to charity Well this is because this year I'm chairman of my local round table and I feel that it eases my conscience a little bit. Time spent in motor racing instead of on my table duties. If I combine the two and race for charity under the banner, race for charity, top of wood rack, then uh, we'll kill two birds with one stone.
said he'd eat the thank you bread today. to see it. Hours of painstaking effort and thousands of pounds have been lavished on this monster of a car. Its engine is a seven and a half litre Chevrolet, so powerful that it means earplugs for even racing veterans. Yet all the prize money it wins goes to charity. Mick Hill is the chairman of the Melbourne Round Table and is combining his racing with fundraising. Today was a crucial one for the car, the first time it had been track tested. In the pits, obviously a nerve-wracking time. Well, it uh, certainly is. Today is the, uh, sort of the final phase in the development of the car. We're going to actually have to drive it around. And when you think the whole effort, uh, the whole project can be written off through a uh, fault of the suspension design, a tyre problem, or as today we've got all sorts of cars on the circuit, uh, you know, to write the car off today would be uh, a, a bitter blow. What's been the attraction as far as you're concerned? The, the actual building of the car? I think, yes, uh, rather than a, a Grand Prix uh, Formula 1 star, my ambition has always been to build e exciting, very fast saloon and GT type vehicles here. Yeah. Are you optimistic about the weekend? Um, I wouldn't have thought so. I, I'm playing it very cool. We're, uh, we're going to enter, we're going to go for a, a finish because uh, my co-driver Kevin Riley is scheduled to drive at Silverstone on Monday and we're hoping that we're going to complete the two races. It's an exciting project that everyone's shown a lot of interest and people want to see it and I always feel that it's nice to appear on the day when it's advertised. The car will make its public debut in an international touring meeting on Saturday and Sunday at Donington but first it had to be tested. A slow first lap, then problems with the oil pressure, routine teething falls for a brand new car. But while the car was being worked on, there were plenty of distractions. Seven ladies from the Melbourne Ladies Circle, who were helping Mick in his charity fundraising, did a lap of their own. With 14 pedals going furiously, who needs seven litres?
As I said at the start of the programme, it's a high-octane weekend for motorsport. There's the 500cc Motorcycle Grand Prix at Silverstone tomorrow, plus the Motor Racing Grand Prix in Germany. We'll preview both of those shortly. But first, some action as we go to Brands Hatch for the Thunder Sports. Murray Walker reporting. Thunder Sports at Brands Hatch, a unique since 1983 event. It is a series of races, but there is not actually a championship. It's a product of the fertile brain of John Webb of Brands Hatch. And there are three classes of what are, in essence, anything goes, two-seater sports cars. The first class is for the really big engine cars, that is to say over 2,000cc. The second class is for up to 2,000cc. 
and the third class is for Sports 2000 cars. And the first televised meeting was last year. It was an enormous success, as has been the formula, because it means that people with appropriate motor cars of all different types can turn out and take part. And in pole position for today's 30 lap, 78.4 mile race is the John Fulston, John Brindley Lola with its uh, 5.7 litre Chevrolet 620 horsepower engine, the car that won at Brands Hatch. Number nine in second position is a most interesting entry. It's the Ecos car. It's a revival of the world famous Acuri Ecos of Le Mans success. It's driven by Scotsman David Leslie and uh, Englishman Ray Malloch. It has a four DFV Grand Prix engine. And as you see, it's second fastest on the grid and it is in the A class. Even more interesting in a way is the third fastest on the grid because number 33 is Peter Lovett, the saloon car expert, three times winner of the British Grand Prix saloon car class, and Ian Taylor. And there Lola has a Mazda rotary engine in it. 46 is James Wallace and Andrew Gilbert Scott. They're the fastest competitor in Class B in their Chevron B19 with its two-litre engine. And then behind them in the same class, Mike Blanchet and Bob Juggins. And the question in this race is, is the nimbleness of the smaller cars with their more than adequate engine power going to overcome the brute force of cars like the Lola 530 of John Fulston and John Brindley, who at the moment have to be favourites by virtue of the fact that they are in pole position and that they had a tremendous scrap for the lead all the way through last year's race, which they actually lost, finished in second place, and here they are coming up at the end of the pace lap to start. And into the lead at Paddock, showing its nimbleness, goes the Ecos car of Ray Malak. Ray Malak is driving. There are two drivers for each car, and there is a mandatory pit stop in this Thunder Sports category in the middle third of the race. That means to say between laps 10 and 20 for drivers to be changed. And so it's Malak leading on lap one. In second position is the Wallace and Gilbert Scott car, and I am not at all surprised to see that John Fulston's car has already blown up in a massive way, spreading an enormous smokescreen and thereby blinding the cars behind him. I say I'm not surprised, although he's going well again now, because he was trailing smoke very, very heavily in the warm-up lap, and it looks as though whatever the problem was has literally cleared its throat, and Fulston is very much on his way again. And there they go, streaming around. There is the grid car of Steve Thompson and Tony Lanfranchi, a 3.3-litre Ford Grand Prix engine car. That's the yellow one there, number seven. And we're on lap one in this 30-lap race, which is 78.4 miles. The shorter race is than is usual in this category because they are regarded as mini-enduro events. David Leslie, the co-driver, it's Ray Mallet driving it at the moment, and you can see how close is the battle between him and Andrew Gilbert Scott, number 46 in the Chevron B19. There are the first three, and Fulston's car is doing it again, an enormous smokescreen being laid as the leaders go off the short circuit onto the long Grand Prix circuit here at Brands Hatch with an absolutely massive crowd to watch this Thundersports event being led on lap two out of 30 by that car, number nine, Ray Mallet driving the three-litre Ecos car, a revival of the days when the Curie Ecos with their Jaguar cars were enormously successful at Le Mans. One-tenth distance and through into the lead goes Andrew Gilbert Scott with his distinctive white and red helmet. 
tremendous. Look at the way he's throwing that car about through much and, and off he spins. Andrew Gilbert Scott going right over the top, almost literally having taken the lead and that burst of exhaust smoke was from the John Thorsten driven Lola. Andrew Gilbert Scott must be ruining that manoeuvre of his. There is the Lola. John Thorsten, I wonder if he's going to be black flagged, although Funnily, it is only in the stretch between Graham Hill Bend and Surtees on the Indy part of the circuit that he gets that tremendous blowout of exhaust smoke. And here is Gilbert Scott, car number 46, taking the lead from Ray Malloch. And now, as he goes into the right-hander at Druids and the course drops away downhill, You'll notice he goes over the curbing there. He's starting to lose control already. Lost his concentration, lost his line, flicks it left, right, and then it steps right out. A complete spin, right-handed spin. And Andrew Gilbert Scott has now got to try and claw his way up through the field, having gone down to about 12th position before he got going again. Now, there is the leader. This is lap four. In second place behind the ACOS is, watch for it, car number 33. There it is. It's the Peter Lovett driven at the present moment. Lola Mazda in 33, that is, in third position. It's the Piper Needell driven by Tiff Needell, Chevron B26 with its two-litre engine. And in fourth place, you can see for yourself the mighty 620 horsepower, 5.7 litre Lola, and there again, as Falston comes out of Druids, I'm sure it must be an oil leak onto the manifold, and it happens at that point only. Falston looking in his mirrors, and of course it's making it absolutely diabolical for the cars that are following the Lola, but they're such a long, long way behind. And I'm having also a very close look at the clearance between the right rear wheel and the wheel arch of car number one there to make sure that it's not rubber smoke. But if it was, I'm sure he would have gone through the tyre by now. And he, he's certainly going very, very quickly indeed. John Falston driving car number one from Dunstall. And this car, there it goes again, is the 1980 Can-Am winning car. That's the... Uh, big sports car championship in America and this car was driven by current Grand Prix driver Patrick Tornbay and won three out of the Thunder Sports races in 1983 last year. We've just had a message from the pits which I'm glad to say confirms what I thought. They believe that there is an oil leak from the rocker box in which case oil will very shortly, because this is where it always happens. Let's watch and see if it does now. Yes, there it goes. Obviously, the centrifugal force is throwing the oil across onto the exhaust manifold, and provided it is not too acute a leak, John Thorsten hasn't got too much to worry about, although it's fortunate for drivers behind him that they're not too close. And now Thorsten is closing up on the... the uh, Richard Piper driven car, that's number 72 in third position in the Thunder Sports race. And the race order on lap six out of 30 continues to be Ray Manor leading in the ACOS. The saloon ACOS. There it comes, number nine. In second position, it's Peter Lovett in the Lola Mazda. In third position, it's Richard Piper. And in fourth position, car number one, John Thorsten. And uh, the first four now have passed and lapped the James Patrick Eric Patterson Malak with its front engine and off in the biggest possible way goes the lead car. That's Ray Malak. Is he all right when he's moving about inside there? And the marshals typically are immediately on the spot, struggling to let Ray Malak out, and it's fire. They've got to get Ray Malak out of there fast. Fire extinguishers to the ready, and they're away. And the door is jammed. Ray Malik is still in the car. This is an appalling development. They've got to get, and thank heavens he's out. He's out and he's seemingly safe. He's moving. 
and a very, very nasty accident. And Ray Mallet, of course, may have... And off comes his helmet, off comes his balaclava, he shakes his head. Well, that was a very nasty accident. And Ray Mallet looks perfectly all right, walking away from what could have been a dreadful accident. But as ever, the British Marshals acknowledged to be the best in the world were on the spot, A, to get Malak out, B, with the fire extinguishers. They all have fire extinguisher training every year. It's an expensive business, but you can see how it paid off here. And there is the sorry remains of the Incos car, which led for so long. And this is how it happened. Watch the car as he goes round the right-hander there, straight off the course, which is exactly what Patrick Tombe did in his Ferrari in the Grand Prix last year. So either the brake failed, or well, I suspect it must have been brake failure for the unfortunate Richard Malik. He's far too experienced a driver to have made a mistake, but anyway, he is out of the race, seemingly okay. A new leader then. New second place, new third place, and here they are all together on lap 10, one third distance, number 33. Driving it is Peter Lovett from Roughton, where he has a car business. The man who has been in racing for some 21 years, chased in second place now by the Tiffany Dell driven Chevron and the big yellow Lola of John Fulston. into the pits as I talk to you has come the John Fulston car for its driver change. Out jumps Fulston, in jumps John Brindley. Both very good drivers, but John Brindley acknowledged to be the faster of the two. Now here is inevitable delay, but it's a delay that applies